So thank you all for joining. Um, we're excited to welcome you to our live webinar titled Key Factors That Drive the Valuation of Your Agency. Um, for those of you who don't know about Productive, Productive is an end-to-end -end tool for running a profitable agency. In Productive, agencies can run all their operations, so from business development, resource planning, budgeting, project management, task management, time tracking, reporting, all the way to billing. But today, um, in this session, we won't be talking about managing agencies as much as we'll be talking about agency valuations or buying and selling agencies. So to introduce myself, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Maria um, and my area of focus is understanding the digital agency landscape and what drives agency professionals. My guest today is Mark St. Hill, Managing Partner at Cactus, who I'd like to welcome now. Hi, Mark, thanks for joining. Thank you, Maria, thank you for having me. <laughs> It's nice. Uh, it's nice to to have you here. Um, I'm gonna just cover quick, briefly what we're going to cover today. So um, we'd like to go through um, a little brief background on Cactus uh, and answer basically the following questions. So how are agencies valued? Who buys agencies? And what are buyers looking for? What factors measure the attractiveness of your agency? And any other considerations that agencies should uh, factor in when in this process of selling. As a note for all, this session is being recorded and it will be sent to all who have registered or who reach out to me after the webinar. <laughs> so without further ado, um, Mark, how are you doing? And um, if if I understand correctly, Cactus has worked with over three and a half thousand agencies uh, or businesses across different phases of growth. Can you please give us some background on Cactus and um, yourself as well? Thank you, Maria. Yeah, I'm doing very well. Thank you. Um, yeah, so to give you a bit of background on Cactus, um, it was started over 10 years ago. And really, it's to help agencies grow and scale from almost kind of founder um, startup through to 5, 10 million revenue. So we, um, we focus on agency founders in the kind of marketing, advertising, media space and related technologies. Um, we mainly support agencies in the kind of earlier stage of their life or the smaller end. So one to 10 million revenue. Um, and, and they tend to be digitally focused given our kind of backgrounds as a, a team of consultants. So, um, you know, our team of consultants of about 20 people have different skill sets. Um, and we but we've all either kind of owned, ran or exited uh, agencies and yeah we're we're here to really help agencies that are different different uh, parts of their journey either scale build value or sell their agencies so I, I specifically lead the m a function and, and mainly focus on selling agencies um so i've been helping and i help them with growth options and preparing their businesses for sale so i've done over 20 transactions in the last seven years always worked in the agency world and I've bought and sold agencies as well as worked in in-house on m a and and as a outsource finance director great great um a lot of I'm sure that there's um there are so many interesting stories behind all those hundreds and hundreds of businesses would you say that re regardless of size or um, type do all these companies in the digital realms, face more or less the similar similar business challenges um yes yeah i mean you wouldn't expect so but yeah there, there are clear patterns um albeit different agencies might experience them at different times i mean typically there'll be a number of factors that hold back their growth whether that's top line revenue growth or profitability um often it comes down to the founder holding back the business or not having the right management team in place or a lack of investment in sales and marketing for example but there's a whole multitude of factors that we'll cover off later on that can impact growth or the value of your agency great I understand. Okay, so then let's move on to how agencies are valued. Um, basically, from what I understand, um, here we have like three main pillars or categories through which agencies are valued, correct? That's right. Yeah, I've tried to sort of break it down around how buyers look at businesses and how they value them. So the first part is uh, and sort of more technical accounting term, what there's equity value versus enterprise value. So the equity value is the total value of a business that is attributable to the shareholders. 
and and the enterprise value is is the value of of the company um, based on a, a multiple of revenue or profits. So the the difference between the two is that often there's either debt or additional cash in the business that forms the difference between the two numbers. So it's it's it's, it's important to understand ultimately what you're going to get out of your business dependent on on those two areas. Um, the second part that's good to, to understand clearly is what kind of deal structures buyers will put forward as part of buying your business. So there's there's a mixture of uh, they buy 100% of the shares of the business. Sometimes they just buy the assets um, or they buy a mi majority or minority stake in the business. And that is either through cash or often and more recently in shares in the in the buyers group, which ultimately is a, a mechanism to tie those sellers in for a few years and motivate them to continue growing the business. So typically you won't get paid your 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 cash up front. It would be phased between an upfront amount and either deferred or contingent on performance. And that would typically be over a couple of years. So those those are the, the those are the kind of typical range, and there's a huge range of different options there that a buyer might put in front of you as a seller to to essentially incentivize you to stay longer as part of selling your business. Um, the third part, which is uh, is fairly critical, is is how they're valued, depending whether you've got a services business just people or a technology business. So, so typically services businesses are valued on a profit multiple, which is called EBITDA, which is essentially operating profit and technology businesses typically on a revenue basis. And that would range from one to 10 um, really across, uh, across both. Whereas um, I would say with services, five times multiple is a starting point um, going up to 10 and you know beyond that if you're much bigger. Sure, 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 sure. Um, so from the perspective of a buyer, when buying, um, they're looking to bridge some sort of gap, correct? Yes. Yeah, so so with, with buyers, it's um, all about kind of filling a strategic need, a, a critical business need in their group. So they're looking to either... Um, I mean, there's, there's scale, size and scale as the first factor which is filling a geographical gap. It could be accelerating growth to, to match uh, a competitor. Um, but the, the critical part is if it's a very big buyer, they need a significant uh, acquisition to move the needle. So we'll find with some of these businesses and buyers that we'll talk about, they won't look at anything that is less than 10 million revenue, for example, because it's just not going to um, change their the, the business uh, strategically for them um so the so the second part is is about the offering and services um it does the does the buyer lack that capability and resource inside or that technology um or do they find it hard to hire or replicate um and are these services kind of new and in demand from their clients that will drive up the valuation price. Uh, and um, so so anyone working in a kind of new digital space, you know, we could talk about AI or data science will be very valuable to buyers and could be smaller and still interesting for them. Um, the third point around, I guess, you know, buyers are looking for differentiation in their offering to their clients and also as bigger groups, diversification. So they, they need to be across different markets and across different sectors in order to protect them from shocks that might impact certain sectors um, and to build their client um, profile, I guess, across different different areas. Um, so the final bit is, is around the buyer profile. Um, so, you know, you can broadly put in um, buyer groups that, buy agencies into the big networks, which are the kind of WPPs, Omnicoms, Publicists, Densus, which typically buy very big agencies or technology more so now. Um, then there's the kind of global groups of Stagwell, S4, uh, Next15. So they typically buy kind of smaller mid-size agencies uh, with a very digital focus. 
So they have a different buyer profile. Um, and then there's specialist private equity back groups, which uh, people like Dept, MSQ, Brain Labs, that have very kind of deep specialisms in digital marketing, in uh, digital products, or potentially B2B. So they have a particular way of a particular shopping list that they're looking for in terms of, of, of acquiring and a different deal structure across these different groups as well. Um, and just to cover off the final two, there's um, IT groups, which are people like Globant, and they're looking for very specialist IT skills or scale. Typically, they won't buy a small digital agency, typically. Um, technology groups, again, they're probably buying more technology-led businesses than services. And then finally, there's there's private equity that are looking to build groups of their own and sell them on. So there, there's a there's a huge buyer pool out there of different groups that provide different opportunities. But you know, it's 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 important to understand your agency and and what a buyer is looking for and which groups are going to be relevant to you. Sure. Sure. So from what I'm getting, um, buyers usually know, especially these big groups and big companies, what they want to acquire or what types of gaps they're looking to fill. But on the flip side, from your experience working with so many different agencies and companies of different sizes, do these agencies really understand their value or what types of buyers, which types of buyers could be interested in, in acquiring them? Um, I think so, some have a, a clear view of who they're likely to be bought by. They work, they work with them. They're potentially a supplier that plugs into the that bigger business. And there's an obvious next step where they 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 become a supplier, a partner, and then and then potentially get acquired. Others, there's a much wider pool of of different options. And I think um, it's it's not always clear. What, what is right for the agency and, and the timing so but buyers typically have a shopping list of of the kind of businesses they they want to buy and they will proactively approach agencies that they're interested to speak to so there will be um you know there will you will find as an agency owner that people will approach you now some of those conversations might be you know serious others might be a kind of fishing exercise it sort of depends but um but yeah yeah. Well, that brings us to our next point, basically. Um, yeah. So these are some of the key pillars that you you probably want to mention or can you can you go through all of them, please? Yeah. So before we're sort of looking at the market and what buyers were interested in and what they're looking for, this is this is more around looking under the hood of your agency and, and looking at the kind of qualitative factors that drive evaluation or a buyer will look at to determine whether it's, um, you know, very attractive or there's potentially some, some gaps. So um, there, there's lots of different categories you can split it into, but broadly here I've, I've looked at commercials, which are the kind of hard financial metrics around revenue and profit growth and how quickly you're going and your track record which is obviously you know the fundamentals to how a deal will be structured but there's there's lots more in terms of the sort of qualitative parts so things like your client list is is very important and a buyer will look at your client list and see how it maps and that's your case studies your ability to to work with global clients and also how the ability to cross sell your clients into theirs so they'll look at that. So the things that will be interesting to them would be the quality of client, how long the client's been with you, uh, and, and that kind of concentration of clients to ensure you're not overly reliant on one or have a long tail of smaller ones. So that's the kind of client, um, um, that, that's how they would assess the quality of your kind of client, um, the client part of your business. Sure, um, which also ties into the next Next point where you're probably going to mention the retained revenue versus shorter term projects. Uh, yes, yeah, so linked to clients, uh, absolutely. I think there's uh, for a buyer having retained revenue or recurring revenue is obviously more attractive than project revenue. And it doesn't mean you have to have that, but it gives them more certainty around what they're buying because um, ultimately they're buying your client list and your people um from a services perspective so the more certainty and stronger that kind of pipeline is uh the more they can, can kind of pay you and more they can pay you up front 
Um, there's there's things around services which I, I mentioned. You know, are you working in a high demand, uh, new high growth area of the market? Um, have you got valuable skills and services in a proposition that they haven't got? And do you have deep sector expertise, which they don't have? So they're all looking for things to plug gaps where they have holes in their area. So different buyers will value different things depending on what they're looking for. So there won't be a consistent kind of valuation methodology sometimes between buyers. Sure, 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 sure. And um, leadership or uh, team. So how how would you measure how strong a leadership team is? Or is this is this what the planned structure is after the buyout? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, again, it's diff difficult to measure. Um, there's definitely, um, you know, the, the skill set of, of that leadership team and those founders are, are, are critical. Um, someone with a finance background might not be as valuable to buy as someone with a very technical background or creative background because they probably have finance capabilities uh, as a buyer. Um, but there's definitely a kind of personality and um, and and sort of shared vision around wh where they see their business going and where they see it going as part of that group. And that only happens through kind of chemistry and meetings. Uh, it does help that you don't have one single founder that is, you know, critical or a key man within the business because that provides risk or puts risk on the buyer if they leave. Or something happens so having a, a breadth of of a management team that covers key functions and key departments is um it protects your value and and gives more certainty the, to the buyer and and the same with team you know they're buying you and your team so they want your team to stick around so they want to look at are, are you know do you have have your staff been retained and have they stayed for a long time because if there's a a pattern of people leaving it's, it's it provides a red flag for buyers yeah, of course so uh, employee churn is quite important to look at as well um in terms of operations uh tools uh everything to manage your your business data to manage basically consolidate your data i mean many many agencies are now you know using a couple of platforms to to execute work how does this influence evaluation um, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. I think there's a, two categories. There's internal tools that drive efficiency, um, productivity, and then there's probably client tools that add value, which you can add pr price or a point of differentiation to your clients. Now, you want, you want to work on, on both of those. I mean, ideally, with, with good tools and processes in place, it should drive efficiencies, things like resourcing, and you should be able to understand what's going on in your business better and, and, and try better margins. Whereas with, you know, the other tech solution and tools that you get, hopefully you can uh, deliver your client work faster and you can do more work for them as a result of um, those tools. So they obviously, any of those tools that you can bring forward to a buyer that they haven't got and they can resell, that's going to be, um, they're going to see value in that, of course. No, yeah, for sure. I mean, um, clearly, when agencies come to you or when businesses come to you, you're you're asking them for all these like hard financial metrics and um, yeah, the the hard the hard data. But you're also looking for for the soft uh, metrics. So you're looking for this, as you mentioned, um, yeah, uh, not only skills but reputation is also re quite important, right? So your brand reputation, how how your um, how your employees perceive you, um, and would you say that you are also now more and more looking into into like review sites for employees or um, or any types of tools that you can measure your reputation by or an agency's reputation by? Um, yeah, I was thinking, you know, apart from the financials and the kind of hard metrics, it's definitely the, the critical thing in, in finding a buyer or, or building a, a deal together would be around the chemistry between the teams and, and the alignment on future growth and the shared vision. Without that, you know, however good the business is and however high, fast it's growing or its margins, it's not going to it's not going to fit um, and, and the deal would be um, deal would be off. 
but um yeah de definitely they you know a buyer would look at all all aspects of the business and their brand reputation and um all the things that uh, indicate that it's been a well-run business um, are useful to track and, and share with the buyer um, because that that demonstrates your um, you know your the, a, a well-run business and and the fact that you're um, aware of the kind of key metrics. So you talk about employees. So there's things like Glassdoor, which people use a lot, which is a review site which um, gives feedback from from staff around whether they like working at a place now that can have a, a significant impact on whether someone wants to buy buy your agency um so there's some internal things that you can do um office vibe is another one which looks at um you know staff engagement and um and happiness so it's worth having these tools here both you know to make sure you've got a, a well running business and everyone's happy but also as a as a, a measurement tool um to make sure um your 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 business is in a good place right sure yeah um would you say that it's it's becoming uh, from your experience is it becoming a more and more popular metric to look at or has this always been quite clear that it's you know necessary to look at alongside revenue alongside ebitda alongside um client concentration um, I, I think it depends what kind of business you've got. If it's a more sort of technology-led business, and they're and the buyers buying that kind of IP, and and they see more value than that, than the kind of team, then then there'll be a different sort of focus. So it'll be, it'll be dependent on what the buyer is valuing from that business and what they that, that they're looking for um, predominantly. So it, it will vary, but given agencies are predominantly people businesses it's obviously going to be right at the forefront of making sure that oh, ideally that team just doesn't leave after you've sold the business to a buyer. So it's, it's pretty critical to, to get that right. Of course, yeah. Um, I have another question for you, Mark. Um, considering all the agencies you've worked with and these businesses who are looking to kind of, you know, evaluate where they are and where they could be potentially going, how many businesses have you encountered that had selling in their mind in the future how, were they i mean do many businesses build as with the prospect of selling in mind or are they just kind of like organically growing and then at some point they realize wow this is really something that i have is valuable i should figure out how to make it even more valuable you know yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, there are serial entrepreneurs that love setting up businesses and selling them. Often, often we meet founders who've come out of agency or agency groups that they've lost, uh, they've lost the love, frankly, and want to be their own boss and 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 start something from scratch. Um, so that that's that's more often than not, the serial entrepreneurs have to be a certain type of person to 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 be prepared to go on multiple journeys. And to build an agency takes time, and you know you won't know whether your your agency is valuable until people start knocking on the door. And if you if you're if you're very smart and very quick, you can do it in five years, but often it takes ten years to to complete that journey so i think um often people don't want to sell on the basis that they set the business up so they weren't an employee so but clearly everyone has uh, an eye on retirement at some point and a, and, a, and a payday so there is that gets to a stage when they've built the agency up and they want to look at the value of it from the shareholders perspective and reward the, you know the hard work that they've done for them and the team and then start kind of planning for an exit but um, often they don't want to talk about it. And it's it's one of those things that is, um, you know, needs to be planned a couple of years ahead, um, given that when you sell, you're going to have to probably be tied in for two to three years. Sure, sure. Um, OK, I think we've gone through all the points here. Um, last but not least, uh, there are a couple of other considerations we need to keep in mind when putting our agency on the market. Um, what are these? Can you go through them? Uh, yes, just picked picked a few out here. Some some we've mentioned already. Um, I mean, quality quality of information and data is critical. I mean, without that, a buyer can't figure out how to value the business, and and if it's not well run and there isn't clear management information, 
then they will likely either tell you to go away and go and find it or they will walk away from the deal because it's too difficult to to figure out the the, the sort of quality parts of the business um so that's 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 really critical um so having good tools and 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 um tracking of of kpis and data is is really important um strong governance you know making sure there's a well run business everyone's got clearly defined roles um well documented um and there's the kind of clear kind of good shareholder structure management team and there's a kind of clear vision and plan for the business are all kind of um very attractive to buyers um so definitely you know thinking about a plan and having a plan for growth is 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 attractive and often people don't have a business plan they're kind of they're kind of working year on year just to to, to help grow and survive their agency so you, you see them less often um a good reputation in the market you know having awards being out there being um ha having kind of content going out to your um audience um speaking at events attending events there's a whole raft of things you can do around marketing and often oh. it's under invested in yeah um so that that part is is an investment but it it should reap a kind of return on on the kind of reputation and interest from buyers sure how just let me touch upon the awards bit um how important are awards really for agencies they're they're you know um there's this clearly there's this uh, arena of um recognition awards or things we can you know participate in as agencies and um I feel like uh, it's something that we all strive for, but also also something that's, uh, as you said, it's an internal investment. It's an investment of time. It's like, should we, you know, use a few weeks or days on applying for this or should we work on client work? Um, what yes. is it's a good question. I mean, if you if you um, applied for all the awards out there, you wouldn't have any time to do any client work. Um, there's a whole industry around awards. So I think, you know, you can look at which kind of awards are most appropriate for your agency to apply for. Um, you know, you, you you talk about a can lion being one of the great things. If you've got one of those in your agency, you know, that's a real stamp of quality. Um, so you probably want to pick and choose the kind of um, awards you go for at, at your stage of growth and what, you know, what kind of work and campaigns you're doing. But, you know, they will obviously make you kind of famous and make your team happy and give you a great reputation on the market, which will attract more talent and attract more clients. And for that client that you win that award for, they'll be they'll be very happy themselves and hopefully stick around a bit longer. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, you also mentioned here low staff and client turnover, which is something that you also, you know, touched upon before. Um, so this is demonstrated how by by good culture, by yeah, it's it's well, I, I there's it's it's easy to say, you know, don't you know retain all your staff. You might not want to retain all of them, and there's 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 a whole process of attracting and and retaining and developing staff that needs to be worked on by you know and and having an HR specialist if if someone in the management team isn't strong there it is critical to your efficiency to the happiness of your agency to the success of your agency so it it's um and and the attractiveness to a buyer so i mean it obviously can't be understated um so it, again like marketing there needs to be investment in your staff and and the development and learning and development of your staff but different businesses are set up differently so you know there isn't a one size fits all and culture is a fluffy word but it is essentially you know is everyone happy working there doing their best work and loving coming into work like how, how you bring that about whether it's remote working or bringing people into an office you have to have to have to figure that out um, and hope, and the same with client turnover. You know, there's some clients that you might not want to work on, or you lose for whatever reason. But it's important that you 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 monitor your client happiness and um, and how you can do a better job. And you know, all, all the same similar metrics to staff, really. Um, going back on the marketing and investments, um, not just the awards, but in general marketing. Um, like it's an industry standard to invest uh, at least three to 5% of your annual revenue in marketing. How, how do you look at agencies who have 
you know, less, <laughs> less investment in marketing. And is this like a red flag? Should they be doing more? What do you tell them? Um, yes, I think, yeah, the three to 5% is, is a, is a good um, sort of benchmark for investment. Um, but there's probably a kind of holistic approach around your marketing, around who does uh, marketing internally out of the, in their role rather than just the external spend on advertising or events. So I think you have to look at, um, you have to build, first of all, build a marketing plan. You can't do everything. Uh, and decide how you break down that investment that's going to achieve you the various goals you want to set, whether it's brand awareness or it's performance. You want to you want to get more hits or build a community um, on LinkedIn with your with your company. So it's 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 got to be um, you've got to step back and look at a plan and decide what the right things to invest in at that particular stage of the business. Um, so you might want to invest in the founders profiles and build up their kind of their personal brands, or you might want to do the opposite and make sure that the whole management team are the face of the business, not the founders. So it's um, it's dependent on the stage, but investment is kind of critical. Sure. And lastly, uh, building tech solutions. We talked about this a lot and I'm sure everyone's kind of looking at kind of AI and how they integrate that into their businesses. But, you know, they're even down to kind of basic, basic tools and and where you can add value to your clients, whether you can build something proprietary or or use tools that are off the shelf that add to your delivery and make an automate task that your teams are having to do repetitively. It's, it's all about building that kind of automation and that value add for the client so that you can charge more, but deliver more in terms of results. So you could, you wouldn't necessarily build them internally unless you had the teams and the appetite, but um, it's definitely something that um, acquirers like, um, in terms of kind of being entrepreneurial and building building tools that you know create solutions for clients certainly sure uh it's time to head to our q a uh we have a couple of questions lined up here um this one is interesting i guess it's a it's a yeah quite basic but very good question one working with agencies and businesses, what will you advise them to focus on first to bring their overall value up? Um, yeah, that's 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 a good question. There's there's a, a long list that we've like, been through today. Quick fix. What's the yeah, quick okay. Fix? Well, I think I think certainly certainly getting your um your management information and your plan together and making sure you have regular management information to understand your performance and and building a growth plan and setting goals and objectives over three to five years that the management team and founders are aligned to. And then it's, you know, you go into execution mode and test, experiment and and improve. But, um, you know, having a backbone of a plan and a a vision for the business and being able to track that is is the fundamentals that often people, people don't look at. Okay. Uh, another question from the audience. I've heard about roll-ups being an effective M and A strategy. What's your take on them? Yeah. So, so, so buying roll-ups in, in terms of buying businesses and creating a group um, are the the fastest way to to create scale rather than hiring people. Certainly in the services space, the challenge is all, always around integration and alignment of those businesses together and how you create a single proposition. The second part is how long it takes to agree a deal and and, and the cost and and aligning on the structure. But if you can find real alignment between founders and businesses, it it does really create value very quickly. And as long as you're both on the same journey in terms of an an exit or next chapter, it's, it's a very good way of um, winning bigger clients, becoming um, uh, having a bigger presence in the market, um, and kind of protecting yourself against c- kind of competition. Sure, great. Another one from the audience: Is the more turbulent business or political environment affecting buyers' appetites and or pushing multiples down? I think well in the technology space, obviously the <clears throat> public markets have been hammered, and te- technology companies have have suffered, and and that 
compounds the impact on smaller technology businesses and their and their valuations. So um, that that's that's definitely been hit. The services side less so, I would say, but there are areas like the consumer side rather than the B two B that has come under pressure due to the uncertainty around um, the economy and consumer spending and confidence due to inflation. So there's pockets of areas where there ha has been um, pain in terms of valuations, but the fundamentals of having a good business and, and all the all the kind of qualitative metrics we talk about have 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 held up well. And there's still lots of bar appetite across the different groups that we mentioned earlier. Sure. Um, another question um, is, so what are some typical concerns that surface from agency founders while getting a valuation of their agency with selling in mind? This also ties back to what we talked about, you know, age, a lot of agency founders having grown their business organically, or, you know, just been in this, maybe they've, maybe they haven't been employed anywhere all their lives. They've had like an agency for 20 years and I'm sure it's, you know, partially their baby, <laughs> their child. How, what other types of concerns come up, anxieties for selling? Um, well, I mean, they put, they might have imposter syndrome about the value of their business and be, <clears throat> be worried that a buyer is going to look at it and go, I don't like this. Um, um, but they also might be thinking, well, if, if anyone finds out I'm trying to sell my agency, they might think that they're selling out <laughs> and obviously wouldn't want their clients and, and team to know. But I think generally when those, those things have been kind of uh, dealt with, you know, it's, it's what will happen to my team and the culture of my business when I sell is the, is the kind of main, main question they're interested in. And then secondary, how, how long will they have to stick around once they sell the business? But um I always feel like when we're talking about, uh, you know, exiting your business, I feel like there, there should always be a, a next chapter in mind beyond, you know, that that's that selling point of your business where you'd have an exciting role or your team and clients would have an exciting bigger group to be part of. So, um, so yeah, so I think it is about it always comes back to that kind of cultural fit and feeling like your team and your clients will 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 value being part of that group more than they did. Uh, as you as a standalone business. Okay. Uh, one more question and then we'll try to wrap up. So one of our one of our attendees has asked or kind of introduced themselves as running an event and video production agency. And they've been approached by their main client to join them. They're planning an IPO in two to three years. And have you had any experience in selling an agency and using the funds from the buyout to buy shares in the client's business? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think if you've been bought by your client, um, yeah, I mean that that doesn't that doesn't typically happen a lot. Um, it, it, I guess it makes sense strategically. Um, you know, Nike have bought agencies. Um, typically, it'd be an agency group buying another agency. Um, the, the the challenge is that obviously, if you're working on other clients, they they probably won't they won't be working with them going forward, given that you're kind of just working for for a single client. But um, yeah. Um, email me after this and let's have a conversation. I can't, can't quite answer that without kind of knowing a bit more, but um, I hope sure. I can help. We, we also have a couple of um, questions left in the Q&A. However, we don't have all the time in the world to go through all these lovely questions. So I'm going to take them and send them, you know, all to you, Mark, and we're going to, we're going to follow up to all our registrants with the answers within uh, the coming few days. Um, we will move on to uh, wrap up right now. Um, so I just wanna go through this quickly for all of you who, who, for all of you who have expressed interest in this topic being agency valuations, we'd like to invite you to try the agency valuation calculator by Productive. Um, this is a new tool we launched recently. You can use it to get an estimate of the value of your agency within five to 10 minutes. Um, besides a general idea uh, of the value of your business, this tool will also give you a detailed report on the different things we talked about today. Uh, so the different factors that influence your valuation, whether it be positive or maybe a negative influence, and uh, it should give you ideas on where to 
where to improve or what to do in the future. Keep in mind that this tool is in beta and uh, we're still working on it. So feel free to give us any of your feedback and know that this is just a, a starting point in the world's evaluations. As a next step, you should uh, speak to professionals such as Mark uh, and his team from Cactus because um, clearly they have you know thousands of agencies behind them. Uh, this is... Um, this is a great way for us to understand where our, our, our agencies stand. Um, yeah, uh, to wrap up, I want to thank you for joining us, Mark, and thank you all for joining us this morning. Uh, if you're interested in even trying out Productive or getting in touch with Mark, please feel free to reach out to us and um, we'll definitely get back to you all with a recording of this webinar and answers to all of your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks.